So tonight, uh, we are going to be chatting with uh, Dr. Ellen Honick, and she is an academic program manager for Gifted and Talented uh, Department of, Public, of Denver Public Schools. Um, she has been a classroom teacher, an administrator, a gifted specialist, a, class, a curriculum developer, a consultant, and an adjunct professor. So she has run the gamut, uh, the classroom and public education, to the college, to administration. She's seen it all, folks. Um, she is currently serving on the NAGC Board of Directors and has authored several books, including Teaching Gifted Children in Today's Preschool and Primary Classrooms, which is designed for teachers and parents, Let's Play Around My House, and Let's Go to the Market, which are part of the Smart Start series um, for parents and caregivers, and then the Teacher's Compendium for Human Rights Education, and various other curriculum uni uh, units and journal articles. And needless to say, she's a busy lady, and she has taken some time out of her day to chat with us today. Um, she's going to talk to us today about fostering high-level thinking using questioning. And if you are in Gifted Ed in the state of Colorado, you know that questioning has been something we've been working on um, fostering in our classrooms for the last several years. So we're really excited that she's going to share this with us today. I think this is going to be a great opportunity for teachers, but also for parents who are helping their students at home or who are transitioning to homeschooling this year. I know that's a big switch for some of us. So tune in and uh, I'm just so excited that Ellen's here with us tonight and we are ready to hear what you have to say. Great, thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that hopefully you all can see the PowerPoint. So what I wanted to do was just talk through some higher level questioning strategies and really focusing on the higher level thinking skills. So as we think about questions, we use questions on a daily basis and we get asked questions on a daily basis and we've all been in the situations where sometimes we're like, okay, why are they asking that question and can they stop asking questions? And what I want us to do is really kind of think about how we can ask those higher level questions and move beyond the who, what, when, where, why, and how questions into some of those higher level questioning strategies. So as we think about strategies and questioning, there's a reason for questions. So it helps us examine logic and reasoning. So the, the purpose behind what's happening, it also provides an opportunity to stimulate growth and creativity and questions are essential for growth. If you don't ask questions, you're not going to learn anything new. The other great thing about questions is it allows us to draw inferences between the things that we're doing and the things that we know. And as we think about it, it allows us to really kind of build our divergent thinking and building up our, our questioning skills. As a classroom teacher, this is a pretty staggering piece of information. 50% of instruction time is spent on asking questions. 90% of the questions asked by teachers require lower level cognitive thinking. So if you think about the Bloom's taxonomy and the lowest level questions, which are basically the provide me an answer, there's not a lot of inference drawn, you're looking at the really concrete skills of can you answer this question? And yes, here it is with a fact and you're not providing any insight into that. And so as we think about that and we think about the purpose of questioning, we really have to dive into the types and purposes of questions. So why is it that we're asking the question? As parents, we have to also think that too. Why is it that we're asking the question? Do we want information from the student and, or the child? And if so, what's the quality and the source of that information? Are we asking more just for their opinion? What kinds of things are we asking for? Are we asking them to interpret something? So if we're asking them to give meaning, then that also means that there's not a right or wrong answer. So there's ways that you can interpret the information that tend to lean towards a more concrete and more, um, more right way of doing that. And there's also the ability to interpret it however you want. There's assumptions. So what is it that we're taking for granted with our questions? 
why are we asking the questions we're trying to get that realization of the assumptions the implications and so where the thinking is leading us so if i'm asking the question then i'm prompting that next that next element point of view is really important when we ask questions you're trying to gather that information and understand where they're coming from which then can lead to the relevance of what it is that you're asking with the point of view it's also important to make sure that you're not judging their point of view a point of view is again it's that it's that element that provides that flexibility that there isn't a right or wrong answer you may or may not agree with their point of view but it is yet in fact their point of view looking at accuracy obviously for accuracy and precision there is a right or wrong answer depending on the way that you're phrasing the question and then consistency so you want to ask the question so that if you're talking about development over time are you consistent over time and how are you asking those questions so that you can think about the consistency within the way that you've answered those questions over time and your thinking over time then we get into some of the compare and contrast so logic is really that is it reasonable and a lot of times we can talk with students and this is where you can ask a logic question and get them to understand that their assumption or their interpretation of information may not actually be the best way because it may not be an, a reasonable answer so again asking additional questions along those lines and then also as you think about it you want quantity so you're listing types of questions when you're developing questions oftentimes depending on what it is that you're doing if you brainstorm a list of questions this is similar to the pro cons list when you're faced with a difficult decision if you ask as many questions as you want and you brainstorm a list of questions if you the ones at the beginning start off pretty easy to come up with the ones in the middle are pretty challenging but then the the ones towards the end are actually the better questions because you can get at more information with the better questions and so again it just helps with that building off the the strategies you can ask questions about personification and feelings comparing and contrasting and then also as you think about questions and letting go of rigid thinking patterns what would happen if and as teachers and as parents again it's kind of that why 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 always coming up you know well why is this why is the sky blue why is the the gra grass green and so again it, it's that what would happen if and so then you can also have some fun in terms of asking questions and having them really prompt their thinking well what would happen if the sky was green what happens if the grass was blue how, how would you know what could happen from that and then also the how come so how come questions are not always meant to be answered and so as you think about what types of questions you're asking you also need to figure out do you really want an answer and as you ask the type of question are you asking to elicit a specific answer in which case then it's really a lower level question it's more of an information type of question if you are trying to be open and you want them to to provide additional information related to their question then you can ask for that how come and and what those those questions are looking like there's three main types of questioning i'm going to talk about and so i'm going to talk about critical thinking questions i'm going to talk about creative thinking questions and mathematical thinking questions and as we think about critical thinking elements it's really important to think these come from criticalthinking.org and they have a fantastic website and they have a downloadable mini miniature crit critical thinking guide that you can download for free and as you're thinking about the critical thinking elements it's important to think about like clarity well what does that really mean to elaborate further looking at accuracy how can you check on that do you want to make sure that it's that it's accurate precision when you're thinking about the precision and the, cl the clarity within that and the and the precision it's the actual level of detail within that relevance is it relevant to the topic that we're that we're focusing on depth how deep you can go what are some factors so i've got some so as you're looking at these 11 
critical thinking strategies, again, it's thinking about, well, what is it that I want my student, my child to know? These are some of the questioning stems. And if you, um, you can go to the criticalthinking.org website and also um, we'll be sharing a bit.ly link with this, the handout. And these all come directly from criticalthinking.org and they have critical thinking stem questions. It's important to, to have question stem so that you're not trying to come up with something on the fly. So as you think about it, if I want to use critical thinking to help a child with their writing, oftentimes children, especially gifted children, will finish a task and then they'll be like, okay, I'm done, here it is. So instead of saying, well, what did you do or go back and add more you can say i want you to edit your writing based on depth so within depth what are some of the complexities of your writing how did your characters looking at depth how did your characters come across with those complexities of the situation what are some difficulties that need to be dealt with did you explain those the right way do you have enough information in there for the reader to follow? So as I think of the critical thinking elements, one of the best places that critical thinking can really dive into, into text and into writing is really looking at it through that writing lens and coming up with editing. And so you don't have to edit. So students generally don't edit very well anyway. And so, and then, and you're left with, well, what am I editing for? Am I editing for grammar and punctuation? Am I editing for, for periods and punctuation? And what is that going to look like? So instead of focusing on that, having them go back and look at the content through one of these lenses of critical thinking really helps elevate their writing and really provides the depth and the, and the complexity to their writing. And some of it is as you watch students write and you practice these, and again, these are, these are skills that you would have to teach independently and concretely, then you can go back and you can put these, these um, different elements onto like a, a cube and then they can roll the cube. So I finish early, I roll the cube and I've got the, the six pieces, the nine pieces that are, the six pieces that are relevant for me. Now I can go back and say, oh, okay, I'm rolling the, the cube and I'm going back and editing for logic. Well, maybe the next time I roll, I'm editing for precision, precision. And then you've got a specific lens to look through. Um, in graduate school and with articles, I use the critical thinking elements to edit my own writing as a professional. And so uh, uh, it's extremely helpful to go back through and look at that lens. Like, is this relevant to what I'm trying to get a to get across and if it's not then how do I make it relevant or is this something that needs edited out creative thinking comes from there's a lot of different creative thinking elements that are that are um, present and as we think about it Epoch Torrance really focused on these five fluency flexibility originality elaboration and evaluation and fluency is really that ability to generate many ideas this is that brainstorming, free association, I give you a topic and you come up with as many as you can think of. The flexibility is thinking of alternatives other than the conventional. So it's that, okay, if I have a paper clip, what can you do with it that nobody else in the room is going to be able to do? And really thinking flexibly, flexibly. That also goes into some originality. So conceiving innovations unique to the context, reviewing alternatives, imagining and combining things. Elaboration is really that extension of new ideas. So providing details for application. So elaboration is I test it, I analyze it, I synthesize it, and then I may have to go back and brainstorm again with more ideas or may have to look a little bit different. And then evaluation is really that assessing the performance. So then analyzing, experimenting, fine tuning. So it didn't quite work. So now I have to go back and modify it to something that I did want, did want to work. So if you're thinking of building a bridge out of toothpicks, or these are a lot of those destination imagination instant challenges where I give you a pipe cleaner, two sticky notes, and a paper clip, and now you have to build a strong bridge or a tall tower. And so now I've got to think about, well, how am I going to use the materials in order to do that? 
With creative thinking, there's a great technique. And yes, educators are um, pretty strong in the, um, oh my gosh, the word just completely escaped me. So scamper is the, I can't think of the name of it right now, but scamper is the technique. And so it's, um, it's the, the letters all build out to something. So the S is for substitute, the C is combine, the A is adapt, magnify or minif minify, depending on which version of scamper you're using, P is put to other uses, E is eliminate, and R is rearrange or reverse. So what that does is if I'm, if I'm trying something new and I have this, I have this project and I want to figure out if it's as good as it could be or if I want to do something, what I want to do is I want to combine it. So if I have two different bridges that people put together, is there a way to combine it to make it stronger? Is there something else I can do? This is a great technique when a lot of students are coming together and they're brainstorming and everybody kind of has their own idea. So it's okay, well, you have this idea and you have this idea. So could you combine them? Could you modify them? Are there pieces of it that you could eliminate? If you took the paper clip or you put this project together, is there something else that you can put to another use? So if we're bridge building and you have the paper clip, the sticky notes, and a straw. Could you substitute one other material to make a stronger bridge? And if so, what would it be? Or how would that change your design? And so it gets into that design thinking and really focuses on the elements of design thinking. There's a lot of different creative thinking questioning stems that you can come up with. Again, this, the scamper technique is one that's pretty easy. It has the, the acronym that you can follow along with, and so it just provides you those steps. Every time you think about questioning, it's important, especially if you're a parent or even as a teacher, to have your own little cheat sheet of question stems because it's really hard to come up with them on the fly. Mathematical thinking is one of the areas that, as a non-mathematical thinker, I think is one of the more challenging areas to come up with. So it's important to think about mathematical thinking that it's not just math. And mathematical thinking isn't doing the math. So it's not the skill practice. It's really focused on the perception and thinking it's looking at underlying structures, patterns, or assumptions. And mathematical thinking is really complex. So it's about that testing of theories. It's pulling the elements and the vocabulary together to come up with some mathematical thinking ideas. So seeing something, and don't worry, I've got an example. So seeing something and then really trying to decide, well, where's the math in it? So the fan is working. So what math would be needed or what math is in there in order for the fan to work. I mean, yes, you have the electrical engineering components, but how did they decide how wide to make the fan blades? How did they decide what angle to make the fan blades at? So as you think about mathematical thinking, you thinking about the vocabulary. And so thinking of shape, time and speed, patterns, temperature, measurement, weight and mass, quantity, Sort, sorting and grouping. <clears throat> so one of the things that everybody thinks about when they think about mathematical thinking is that my child comes home with homework <clears throat> and I don't know how to help them. What you can do with mathematical thinking questions is you don't have to understand a thing about the math that the child is working on. You need to ask the right question to support your child. So in the bit.ly link, there's a handout that has all of these mathematical thinking questions. And this is one of the things that uh, we talk about in terms of homework help. And we look at it in terms of homework help and really at what is it that your child's struggling with in terms of the math? If your child's stuck, Ask them, what do you know that's stated in the problem that they're already seeing? How did they tackle similar problems before? 
I don't know a thing about what they're working on, but I can ask them those questions. Now I'm relying on the student to tell me what it is that they already know or to come up with some problem solving strategies to help figure that out. What is it that you need to find out? Now, I can tell you the first time you ask your child these questions in a homework situation, they're gonna be frustrated, you're gonna be frustrated. So it takes a little practice, so maybe pick one and then figure out how to balance that help with what you're doing. As a teacher in the classroom, these are some things that we kind of come up with naturally. And at the same time, if we already have the question stems figured out, then it's easy to figure out what's going on. So if I want to check their progress, I can ask, well, can you explain why it works that way? I want to make sure they're understanding what's happening. How did you reach that conclusion? What strategies are you going to use? Does your answer seem reasonable? Why or why not? Can you describe your method? Can you explain why it works? So as you're thinking about homework, again, I don't need to know advanced level algebra. I can say, what other problems are similar to this one that you've solved in the past? Where can you look for an example? What is it that you're solving for? And hopefully by prompting the student and the child, you'll be able to help them figure it out on their own and provide them with some strategies. It's not, you, you will still have homework angst, so please know that this is not going to take away all of your homework angst. So in one of the books that <clears throat> we have, um, myself, Nancy Herzog, and Barbara Dullahan all worked on three different children's books that are designed for preschool, focusing on higher level questioning skills. And what we've done is we've asked a critical thinking question, a creative thinking question, and a mathematical thinking question around the photo. The books are designed to be interactive. They're not designed as a sit down and read kind of book. So for example, the child, and again, these are designed for three-year-olds to five-year-olds, the books are, but the strategy can be used with anything. So pick an image. So here we, we describe the image of the child's playing on the playground. Look at how much fun he's having. Let's talk about how we play on the playground. Our creative thinking question is what are all the ways the boy could play on that piece of equipment? I could also use a scamper technique and say, what would happen if I eliminated the handles? How would that piece of equipment work? What would happen if he sat down on that equipment? If we, if we changed it or replaced something and we moved the handles and we replaced them with ropes, what would, what would the experience look like and be different for the child? So again, I can use creative thinking within the same picture. Critical thinking, why do you think he's leaning backwards with his eyes closed? So again, thinking about his experience walking through those different steps. I can also think about the logic. Does his holding on to the handles, is that a logical place for his hands to be in that position? If he were to move them, would that would that look different and how would that how would that fit and if he moved one hand would he still be able to hold on so again you're you're taking that logic the relevance how is his laying back and playing on that piece of equipment relevant to the rest of the, the elements on the playground we can't see the rest of the elements so this is where then you can combine the critical and the creative thinking well what else do you think the playground looks like you can see that there's a road so he's on some sort of either rubber surface or, um, or mulch type surface. So what other kinds of things can you do? So then we get into the mathematical thinking. So this piece of equipment can spin. What would happen if he spins too fast and how could he slow down? So now we're starting to add that movement into the mathematical thinking. So you can start to think about, well, what would happen if we change the shape of the base? What would happen? And you can start asking these questions. There's no right or wrong answer. And so as you analyze and you help children think about this, it's important to recognize that there's not necessarily a right answer. You could say the exact same thing, have two completely different answers. I could make the base wider and they might say, well, it's not gonna be as much fun. That's a perception question. I have no way of knowing if that's a, an accurate, if that's accurate one way or the other. 
So as you think about using these on kind of that everyday life, it's important to recognize that you can, if you have the question stems already figured out and you have kind of that list, you can start using those higher level, higher level questioning skills and you can start embedding and asking more questions and engaging in more conversation. And then it becomes a creative and critical thinking and as well as mathematical thinking. So if you start embedding all three of these types of thinking and questioning into your everyday, you're gonna start seeing higher level thinking and students are gonna be able to engage more at that higher level because they're able to really think about things more critically and, and put pieces together. As you think about questions, it's really important as a teacher to figure out the goal and purpose of your lesson. Why is it, what is it that you're hoping for the, the students to know? If it's a concrete skill, then you need to ask a concrete question. If it's a question that's more focused on the relevancy and what's happening, then you wanna make sure that you're, that you're focusing on that opinion type of question. So why is it that you're asking that question? Do the questions guide students to think about their own thinking? Or are you, guiding the, are you asking the question to guide them to an answer? Lower level questions or lower level thinking is gonna guide them to the right, the right answer. And so what we wanna do is really help them come to the answer asking a variety of different ways. Are the questions complex? and are they multi-level? And that doesn't mean that there's like 15 different things, but have you started combining multiple elements within that? Are you asking a mathematical concept and a critical thinking concept and a creative thinking concept? And so what kinds of things can you do with that? As you think about your questioning, it's important again to go back to the types and purposes of your question. Why are you asking the question that you're asking and what's gonna happen if you don't ask the question, are you just kind of spilling space? There's a lot of different resources available to ask questions and I didn't spend time looking at Bloom's or depth of knowledge, so Bloom's taxonomy or the depth of knowledge. I also didn't spend time in looking at um, the, um, the depth, depth and complexity icons from Sandra Kaplan. And again, with those questions and the depth and complexity icons, you can layer them on top of each other. If you're brand new to the depth and complexity, then start with one, pick a couple that you like, start focusing there and asking higher level questions. And then as you get better at it and the students get better at it, then you can layer them. So then you can be looking at multiple perspectives and ethics. You can be looking at the big idea, multiple perspectives and ethics. The other great thing is there's lots of tools out there. Mentoring Minds has some great questioning tools. And these are just, um, they've got power words that are written on them. So if, you, if you're looking for question stems and you want students to analyze something, then you can use words like distinguish, divide, document, examine. Again, we're moving away from the who, what, when, where, why, how. And as we've been trained years and years, it's really easy to come up with who, what, when, where, why, how more on the fly. And so if we're looking for evaluation, then we can start asking discriminate between these two. Uh, consider, construct, summarize. If you're looking to synthesize, adopt, compose, cultivate, interact, rearrange, reorganize. And so these are ways that you can, again, not have to come up with the stem yourself, but have two or three different stems that are up on the board and that you can go to so that as you're starting to prompt that. This is even more critical now when we're online and in a remote environment, as many of us are, to engage those discussions and to have questions that prompt enough variability within the answers to actually lead to discussion, especially when you are not face-to-face -face in person. Another thing is if you're looking for creative writing, um, I bought these at a game store. And so these are just story cubes. And so this is great for creative thinking. So you roll the cubes and you roll the dice and these ones specifically are, are um, on fantasy. And so you roll the cubes and they've got little images on them. So again, this one is fantasy. So let me try to hold it up. 
So on the different cubes, you've got different things. So you roll them and then basically there's, there's nine cubes in here and you roll them all together and you have to come up with a story that includes all of those elements. And so again, you're, you're pushing the boundaries. It's creativity, but it's safe because somebody's already kind of told me what I, what it is that I can do. And they come in all different, in different, um, different sets. So this is the fantasy one. There's um, an orange one. It looks like there's one for voyages. There's just general story cubes. And so depending on what you can do, you can mix them all up. You can do different elements with them. Or if you only want students to have five elements in the story, you can kind of break them up that way. And then it provides that opportunity for creative writing. And I can't come up with an idea. Well, this is a great way to do it. There's another fantastic resource called Thinkits. It's T-H-I-N-K dash E-T-S. And you can Google that on Amazon and it's a little box and it comes with all of those little teeny like McDonald's toys, only smaller that are like little trinkets. And then again, you can put different elements into the little jewelry bag and then students can pick and create their own stories. There's all sorts of different, different elements within that. What I would encourage you to do is buy one, get the instructions and then make your own with garage sale finds. So this is my contact information. In the bit.ly drive, I have the critical thinking handout. I have the creative thinking handout. I also have the types and purposes of questions, as well as the math homework or math support and guiding questions for math support. And um, the handout is one document with all of those linked. And then I do have some Spanish versions of the math questioning the critical thinking and the creative thinking in a separate folder in there. But if you can't find something, let me know. I've also created um, paper cubes with critical thinking and with the critical thinking stems on them as well as the creative thinking stems. So if you want to use the cubes, just email me and I'm happy to share those that resource with you. So thanks. So I think I've got time for questions if there's any questions. You're on mute, Miranda. Hey, we got to number 16 of these conversations with Tag T before I realized I was talking on mute. So I feel like I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> um, we, we had a couple questions come in early on that I jotted down. I'm gonna have to refer back to the chat for a couple more because um, we got a, quite a few right there at the very end there. Um, but early on, Deron Turner asked, as you were going through like types of questions, very one of your very first slides, um, what kind of resources or information would you have for maybe like more culturally re relevant or responsive questioning? Is there is there a um, resource or a tool or a strategy that you might uh, prefer over others? Um, I don't know of a specific tool. There's the Bloom's Banks model that helps really overlay some of those specific strategies. But in terms of the types of questioning, it's gonna depend on the purpose and the relevance of what you're, what you're doing. So, I mean, obviously depending on your material, if your material is not culturally relevant, then it's not really gonna matter. Then you can ask some of the more um, implications, interpretation questions, but in terms of asking specific culture responsive questions, I don't have a resource off the top of my head. If you email me, I can do some additional thinking. Um, I do know the Bloom's Banks model has, um, it's more of a, it's more of a, a framework in terms of looking at that. Um, and then I've got one, um, I've got another one from Yemi Sturbridge, but his is more around the picking and designing of the curriculum materials, not necessarily the questions that you're asking within. And I think if you, with a lot of questions you shared, I think if you ask really open-ended questions, why do you think that? What is it that led you to that conclusion? I think we allow for a variety of perspectives and interpretations in the dialogue in the classroom. So I think um, to kind of, you know, piggyback that open-ended questioning um, kind of 
kind of allows for, for that openness of dialogue in the classroom. And I think specifically when you're asking those open-ended, making sure that, making sure you know why you're asking the question. Am I asking a question of perspective or am I asking a question of a fact that I want them to share? And if they're not sharing the same perspective as me, what is my response and how am I gonna make sure that I'm not diminishing their perspective? Their perspective is their perspective regardless of what the curriculum says. So. Mm -hmm. Making really, sure that really it's all there. Yeah. Really good point. Um, and then, I, and I, I hope I, Nalushi, I hope I say your name, I said your name correctly. Nalushi said, um, so, and I don't know what grade she's teaching or what grade her students are, but she said inferential questions are a bit hard for kids to answer because they tend to answer it with their general knowledge. As far as making inferences go, do, could, do you have any specific strategies that can help? Maybe get people out of, get kids out of the um, what's right in front of them and have them help them to infer. We know sometimes our gifted kids can be kind of literal. And I think some of that goes into perspective. So maybe sharing something that's not related to the text and then having them really draw on that personal experience. And then it, it just takes practice. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, drawing those inferences. And again, is, is there, are there other questions that you can ask that kind of set up that inference? Um, and again, depending on your class and your students, some are very black and white and it doesn't matter because that's not exactly what it said. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter how many different ways you're going to ask that question. They're going to struggle with, with that inference anyway. Yeah. And I think, I guess I feel like I struggled with, with guiding that, but I think you're right. It does take a lot of practice in knowing what, what to, what kind of things to bring in to help them see and make those inferences and, and make those connections um, to what they're, they're reading or discussing. Um, a couple things, and we're gonna wait for a couple more questions to come in because I think I have a few more coming in, um, but I wanna make sure I, I catch them all. And um, we did post the link, the bit.ly link. I did pin it to the top. So if you're watching and you're wondering where the heck that resource link is, it is pinned to the top <laughs> of the discussion. So if you're watching, go ahead and, and access that. Um, we did, um, and Nalushi asked another question about what kind of comprehensions can I ask? Is there a resource I could refer to? So Nalushi, go ahead and scroll to the top of your comments and you'll find that link. Um, it will also be posted on our coloradogifted.org uh, um, website with the YouTube link to this presentation recorded. There was, and I'm gonna say from my perspective, uh, I had an aha, like a kind of, it was like, do you ever have those that they're like a duh, but also an aha? like. <laughs> Well, yeah, that makes total sense. You said something like lower level questioning will guide them to an answer. Higher level questioning will guide them to thinking about their thinking. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, of, of course, but it just, it just never occurred to me to phrase it that way. And when you phrase it that way, it is so 100% absolutely clear that, you know, if I want them to get to an answer, the questions I'm going to ask them are going to push them to a concrete answer. But if I want them to really address how they came to an answer, how they're thinking about a topic or how they're um, molding an idea in their brain, those are metacognition questions. And those Absolutely. are always higher level. They're always higher level. And they're also, from a facilitator standpoint, they're also harder to come up with <laughs> in, the, in the heat of the moment. So, I mean, we spend a lot of time on questioning. And what I would say is that before any lesson, plan out two or three or four questions and question stems that you want to prompt the thinking. It's easy to come up with fact-based questions kind of on, in, the, in the spur of the moment. But when you're trying to come up with something else, again, we go back to that who, what, when, where, why, how. And while they can be higher level questions, if we can start using some of the higher vocabulary about analyzing and comparing and contrasting and synthesizing, mm -hmm. and you can use those with really young children. Again, you just have to teach the vocabulary and then teach them how to do it. And they're gonna be able to start synthesizing information. Well, if they're synthesizing information, they're giving you the facts that, that you're asking and they're able to do it at a much higher level. And 
to be honest, they're probably coming up with much better answers than we ever thought they could. And they're drawing those inferences in ways that we wouldn't necessarily have laid out in the lesson plan. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you, you also brought up a good point about like those, those younger kids having to kind of front load some vocabulary. But I, I know just from my experience, sometimes it's, we, we've been working with depth and complexity. And I sometimes will get teachers who say, well, we're only going to focus on these because I, I don't, we don't think the kids are ready for ethics or ready for rules or ready for, and if you, you know death and complexity, this language is familiar with you. And I was like, really? Because ethics seems like <laughs> something every preschool kid is very concerned about. And, yeah, ethics and <laughs> fairness. and <laughs> Exactly. It's not I fair. Think, so I think you're hundred percent right. Like um, we, just because kids may not have the vocabulary doesn't mean we can't build that cognition and that um, metacognitive thinking in our littles, you know, and really say, hey, we can definitely have these kids um, thinking about why, well, why wasn't that fair? And what did Jimmy do on the playground that upset you? And, and well, how long did you have the ball? And how long, you know, are you sharing? And those are, those are social questions, but they're also like, asking kids to think about their thinking. And, and I think we can absolutely do that. And we can't underestimate our little pre-Ks and our Ks. Absolutely not. I mean, and there is no reason that if you're going to do a unit, big and small, you cannot be, I mean, you should be using macro and micro. They understand those terms. So use micro, use macro. Mm -hmm. It's no different than, I mean, you're teaching a concept of big and small. So teach macro and micro. I think the sooner we start like allowing kids to expand their vocabulary, I just think, you know, the, the, the better it'll be for everybody. I also said, you know, a lot of the questioning strategies, the scampers and stuff are great for um, project-based learning or passion projects, really getting kids to think about what is it that, um, that I am, that I am thinking about how am I going to think about it from multiple perspectives and different ways and see it through different lenses and take things away and put things back. And I think sometimes project-based learning become, becomes just projects because we don't insert those questions. And I think with everything, so um, I've actually done a presentation where I've taken some experiments straight off of the websites, just the basic, like, here's a Ziploc bag with water, and then you put a pencil through it. And if you add the higher level questions to that experiment, then all of a sudden you're starting to learn and ask different types of questions and you're getting more information from the same exact experiment. And so it's, it's taking the things that we're already doing. We already ask questions as educators. We're asking questions all of the time. So let's figure out the higher level questions that we can then push the thinking of our students further. And so then we're able to make those leaps and those connections. And it just, we're doing it anyway. It's a strategy mm -hmm. we're all using. And so we just need to reframe it a little bit to ask the higher level. For sure. And I think, I, I just, I'm like, I was sitting here while you were doing this. I was like, all these resources, I was just taking notes like crazy and uh, the mentoring minds and the story cubes. And I've used the story cubes. And I know that part of um, our struggles with some of our, our um, districts that are all remote right now is how do we get to know our kids and how do our kids get to know each other? You know, that social, um, Julie Skolnick touched on it last week about like that social connection is so important right now. Absolutely. And how can we do that? How can we foster that? And I view story cubes um, as a group activity. Absolutely. And so each kid would get a cube and one, I just like randomly pick a kid to start and he would start telling about his cube. And then, then, and then I like time it. You get like 30 seconds or 60 seconds, no matter how much time you had. And then the next person would have to like add on to the story but bring their cube into it. And it was just, it became a conversation. You could do it in written form, but you could also do it as a discussion format. And I think the kids were rolling laughing, you know, and just. I've done it as an icebreaker with grownups. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're so versatile. Just something different. <laughs> I mean, it's the best $6 I probably spent. Yeah, <laughs> they're super fun. And there's, I mean, there's lots of ways to do it. Those are just ones that are already there. I mean, you can do the you know, you put the topics into a jar and they pick out the nouns and the verbs and then they have to come up with the stories that way or the, the actions and things like that. But um, oh, yeah, if you're looking for something pre-made that you don't have to. There's have so to many great options. Yeah, that's so easy. You just put it in a jar and shake it. You know, I love your idea of putting the questions on different sides of dice. 
-hmm. And you can just Google dice template on um, anywhere and you can find a word template that you can put the questions in and cut it out and fold it and tape it up together. And it's great tool. I love it for the depth and complexity icons, but I love it for the question ideas, like early finish. And I have samples for creativity and for creative and critical thinking. So if people want, um, they just need to email me and then I can add them to the Google Drive. Perfect. Perfect. And is your email in the bit.ly? Um, it's in the presentation. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, and this is recorded, so we'll go ahead and, and there's that, yeah, and there's a, there's a, the presentation copy is in there. The PDF. Perfect. perfect. We will go ahead yep. and do that. You got a compliment um, yep. on her, Anna D'Onofrio. She said, our guest has the coolest bookshelf styling ever. <laughs> tell this is an active mind at work here. <laughs> I told you someone with yep. shelves. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I've got the Marvel and the Star Wars and then the, the Disney and the books. <laughs> okay, and we have, um, oh, and Susan says, great point about projects versus project-based learning. I know that's probably, as a gifted instructor, that's probably like our pet peeve. Like, that's not PBL, that's just a project. <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, Duran has another question. Um, as a perspective from a parent, but also an educator, um, it's, it's a question of getting a cultural relevancy. So I'm, 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 I'm hoping that we can um, answer this in a way that relates back to your presentation. So is cultural relevance important? And I think, I think of course it is, if we've learned anything in the last several years in the state of Colorado about how we guide our gifted instruction and guide our instruction in general, cultural relevance is important. Um, how could, this would be something you would have to think on and that I would have to think on too. How can we create questions that help them bring their culture and help us bring their culture into the curriculum? And I think that's maybe something that, that might all, almost be a whole nother separate topic or like a separate, we'd have to do a whole separate presentation. I think that a lot of, I mean, culture is absolutely critical and race is even more critical if you're not seeing your children and your students for who they are and their culture that they're bringing, then you, you're not seeing your, your classroom. And curriculum is only as good as the students and the delivery of the curriculum. And what you want is you want curriculum that's engaging. And so if the curriculum isn't, if students can't see themselves in the curriculum, then you need to make sure that the curriculum is relevant and then you need to do replacement or, um, yeah, you should just replace it is what mm -hmm. you should do. Yeah. Whether or not your district, again, I'm speaking personally and not professionally, right. um, but making sure that, that you've got that. And then obviously, if you've got, you have to know your culture of your students. So if you've got students that don't like to share a lot personally with you because they're more guarded, then you don't want to be asking these like constant questions that are going to push them into areas that, that kind of bump up against against their culture mm -hmm. and again you have to go back to the why am i asking the question am i asking the question to dive into am i asking the question to understand the content or am i asking the question to understand their thinking or am i asking their the, the question to make sure that they are relating to the content mm -hmm. um and it's possible that the that you may want the relating to the content and it may not you may not get that because it may not be anything that the child can relate to. And so it's making sure that you've got um, a real understanding of your curriculum and a real understanding of your students to really dive into those types of, of questioning. And absolutely, you should not pick any questions that you haven't already thought about your students and, and the way that their, their perceptions and their culture impact the questions and the materials. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think you're definitely right. If you feel like something is, <laughs> is not culturally relevant, you should probably, uh, or, yeah. you know, you probably just get rid of it. But again, like- yeah, I think get rid of it, replace it with something much better. Right, and there is so much better stuff out there. So right? much better. That we're, not, that we're not accessing or using that we definitely should be using. Um, I think that was our last question. Um, 
And, oh, Colin, Colin's here. He kind of clarified, he said the premise of the question, Duran's question was maybe, do students need info to be culturally relevant to make a connection? And I'm not sure that's right. Part of what I'm always careful about ex is expanding thinking. And you're working with Colin, aren't you in DPS? A little bit, yeah. A little bit, okay. So part of what I'm always careful about is expanding thinking. I have no connection to skiing, never done it, not even sure I want to try it. Um, but I could, re from a person who lives in Colorado who's only skied twice, I get you, Colin. Uh -huh. um, but I can <laughs> still read a story about skiing if you tee it up right. Correct. So she said he's trying to clarify, is that what you're thinking, Duran? So yes. otherwise we can limit our kids' horizons. Um, and so... Yeah, and I definitely, I mean, just because it's, there, there's a difference between expanding thinking and being culturally relevant and responsive and open mm -hmm. um, and recognizing cultures. Yeah, yeah. And I think, Colin, thank you for, for helping with us clarify. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for clarifying. Sometimes on the spot, I'm not that great. No, not, that's great. Uh, and I'm, I'm not, not even coffee. seeing it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm not as, as adept at the... Uh, scroll through the, yes. the comments as Colin was apparently. <laughs> well, he's a pro. He's a pro. Um, <laughs> he but I, I like that. I like that point Colin made about like, hey, so I, um, I've never been to, you know, South Carolina or whatever, but I love where the crawdads sing because she was able to make it uh, so vi visceral to me. I was able to see mm -hmm. it, you know, like I think I read about things that I've never experienced, but the reason I attach myself to it and find relevancy in it is because of the way it's shared with me right. in a way that's vivid or in a way that makes me connect it to something else I'm familiar with. And so I, I, I think that makes sense. And that's definitely where the questions come in. So, you know, on the surface, it doesn't look connected, but what experience have you had that's similar and can we compare and contrast something yeah. that makes it more meaningful? Perfect. Perfect. And, and that's the whole point of this talk is, is how can we use questions to connect kids to what we're learning in a higher way and in, in, a, in a deeper way. So thank you so much. I think, I mean, we got, kind of got a flurry of questions there, so I'm sorry about that. Right. <laughs> um, but that was great. Sometimes that's what happens. We, we kind of go through the, the talk and then we get a very big flurry of questions and then it just kind of pitters out. So um, Ellen, I'm, I am excited to share this presentation with my district. Um, I'm excited to share this, your information with them. Um, I thank you so much for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule. Absolutely. To meet with us and, and to answer all of our, all of our questions um, with so much knowledge and insight. So we just are so happy you came and well, um, we're, we're glad to have you. So next week, um, we're going to have um, Kim... Um, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now on her last name. I think it's Schmidt. Um, and Lindsay Reinhardt uh, from DU are going to be presenting next week on, um, I think, underrepresented populations. I'm really excited to hear what they have to say. And another local Colorado crew. We just love our Colorado gifted friends. It's so great. And then we get to join people from Australia and Brazil in our chats. And we're just so great to expand um, understanding gifted ed. And we just appreciate you so much, Ellen, for joining us tonight. And, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And our CAG-T followers, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope we answered all your questions and we gave you a whole ton of resources going into the school year. Um, everybody have a great night and we're signing off. We'll see you next week, same time, same place, Tuesday at five o'clock. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.